Lisa Whittle, I'm so excited that you were on the show. Thank you for your yes. I'm excited to be here. This is okay. fun. So, so we have to we have to give we have to give the listeners like a little love and introduction to not 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 you yet not you yet because I feel like there is a synergy when we talk because we've known each other. I was trying to figure this out. How long have we known each other? I don't know. It's it feels like just an eternity, and I don't even know when it started. Probably we had slimmer waistlines and more elasticity in our skin. Maybe well, maybe that's why. <laughs> guaranteed. That's 100%. If it was in my history, there those things were in play. Uh, you know, I love it. I'm so glad. Uh, you, okay, you've you been podcasting longer than I have, but this is the first time that you have been on my podcast. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm also, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell on ourselves. Can I okay. tell on ourselves? Let's yeah. just keep it real. Oh, yeah. So we tried to do an interview. Do you yeah. remember this? Yes. <laughs> Train wreck. <laughs> I mean, so many problems. I, I I don't think I've ever had those many problems on any any show that I've ever tried to do. It was embarrassing. I'm a podcaster. I podcast all the time. <laughs> My audio was garbage. I, for some reason, I had no Wi-Fi. I'm like, she probably wait, wait, thinks. Wait. Do you remember what earrings? Do you remember no. the earrings? What you happened? were wearing like these long leather feather earrings and it kept on touching the microphone and I didn't I didn't want to interrupt you and I'm like this is the first time you're on the show and I'm like I I, I want to let her flow this is gonna be fun and we, Bianca, we couldn't even use the audio Lisa we you're way too nice no you're way too I would have said take those earrings off right now you look Let's, fabulous you look well, fabulous it, listen I, I was embarrassed because here I am a podcaster I do this all the time and yet I mean, what a fail. No, you should have told me. <laughs> Take the earrings off or we're, this, we're not running this show. <laughs> so this is where I want to start because in the season, we've been having conversations about resilience and what it takes to be resilient. And we've spoken to many uh, resilient people. We have so many practical handles. But this is the point of the season and also for the podcast that there's no other person I want to talk to other than you about those moments of perceived failure and the emphasis is on perceived because failure mm. always moves us forward but perceived failure falling down feeling really disappointed and dare i say disillusioned with god mm. where we ask a lot of why questions and um I, when i think about the person that i want to talk to to coach myself and other people through some of the whys and worries of life that we'll unpack a little bit later it's you but before you come in with a voice of authority that you have earned and you definitely carry, I want, I want to kind of have like a keep it real moment. I want people to yeah. know the realest version of you. And one of the things that I recently discovered about you is that you were a church planner. Hmm. And um, we don't have to talk about that, but I just think like, bring us into one of those moments where you were left to ask yourself, why did this happen? Where are you, God? Like, did I get this right? Can you bring us into maybe a moment? Um, because people can look at you and say like, wow, she's incredibly successful. She's a podcaster and she's an author. She's a Bible teacher. This woman has it all together. Uh, take us through the moment where you feel like you failed and you didn't know what to do next. Oh man, I mean, that that is, uh, that's very easy for me to tap into Bianca because that, I don't really, we don't really talk about the, the whole church planning experience. It feels like it was a blip on the screen. We only we planted a church. We only had the church for 13 months. What was interesting about the whole experience is people were either in one of two camps when we were getting ready to close. They were either like, well, why are you closing? Everything's going fantastic. Those were probably the people that weren't helping us at all. So they thought everything was going amazing. Or, you know, we had the people that were saying, I don't know how you did it this long. We were worried, really worried about you. So, you know, it was one of those things that it felt very lonely. I mean, I don't have to tell you what it feels like to be a church planner, but I think the heaviness came from the failure aspect of it. Nobody wants to start anything that they don't feel like they can finish. And I think it was one of the things that felt like, um, you know, when we were leading people somewhere that we couldn't take them all the way, it felt like, you know, we had perhaps misled people into something that uh, we, we then now it was a bait and switch. Oh, we're not going to actually do it anymore. I want to tell you what was the most, one of the most profound things for me, Bianca. I remember after we closed the church and I, I wrote about this at some point, that I woke up the next morning and I thought, well, I'm still breathing. That's good. Because sometimes it feels so heavy when you fail at something that you need to like feel the breath inside of you still to go, oh, I'm still here. Like you need that. 
And it's powerful to feel that you still have breath in your lungs. And I remember this moment saying, well, here's what's awesome about this. I can still serve God for the rest of my life. I'm just not going to serve him in this space. And that might seem silly to someone like, well, of course, that's the reality. But I think there's a place inside of us when we start something that we don't finish, that there's a lie inside of our head that says you won't continue to serve God. When in actuality, it's you just won't continue to serve God in that space. And you need to be able to separate those things. That particular space, no, you won't serve God in anymore. But you will continue to serve God for the rest of your life. Because until you have no more breath in your body, you're still going to serve God. And I think that was important for me to make that distinction. So... We jumped in. We jumped into the the deep end here, but I feel <laughs> like it's so easy right now, where people want the slick and the cool and the three steps, the five ways, the yeah. seven you know steps to do what you step into your success. But I really want us to camp out here on the why questions. Yeah. So you led us through a painful season and a painful moment. And uh, I know that there's people out there that they may not be asking the why questions right now, but at some point. At some point, a relationship's going to end. Uh, there might be getting fired from a job or a failed business pitch or a failed friendship where you yeah. find yourself saying, okay, but why? Yeah. And what about my future? And what's next? Uh, I, I think when um, this topic first kind of surfaced, I wanted to have an honest conversation. And I know that you're passionate about some of the whys and worries about now and the future. Where did this begin? And we are gonna talk, about, we're gonna learn from your expertise and some of the things that you've processed and you put down into steps to help us understand and process some of the why moments. But what was the genesis of this? Like, where did you become passionate about getting language, practical handles and steps to move forward when we are wondering why? Well, it, it really started with something that I experienced in my life that was pretty unexpected for me as, a woman who had already, you know, raised some kids, written books, taught the Bible, but I started having night terrors, Bianca. Mm. And that was not something that I thought was going to happen. Now I have to tell you, if I, you know, kind of give you a little bit of context here. When I was uh, born, I was missing my middle soft spot. This is going back a lot of years, but uh, in, in history, it's important because I didn't realize this, but I had neurosurgery when I was born. It actually saved my life. And uh, so I didn't know that neurologically that can bring on night terrors in, in, in your life, but no one had ever told me that. And so when I started experiencing night terrors in my adulthood and I hadn't had that before, I didn't realize where they were coming from. Uh, but I also feel like there was a spiritual aspect at play a hundred percent, you know, as you begin to take on more and more things for the kingdom of God, there is absolutely spiritual warfare that happens. I believe in that in mm -hmm. the spirit realm. And so I began to have night terrors and I'm going to tell you, I would wake up in the middle of the night. It was just this heaviness of there's so much chaos in this world. Uh, I know that I'm just one person. I can't protect my kids from everything. I can't, you know, protect myself from everything. What am I going to do? And, you know, carrying the burdens of hearing other people's lives and just the realities of what they were going through and the, the injustices. And I'm, I'm a justice driven person. So I can tell you that piece of injustice can almost drive me mad. And I just began to experience the heaviness in the middle of the night mm -hmm. that would on, honestly, it would keep me awake. It would wake me up in a cold sweat. Uh, and I just began to cry out to the Lord and say, God, I've got to know and have the assurance that you know what's happening, that you are going to set things straight. Mm. Listen, I know the word of God. I know what it, I know what it says. I know that he promises that, but I was feeling very, very concerned. And there were a lot of worries. There were a lot of whys. And so I just began to dive into that. And that was really what was going on in my life to make me look deeper into scripture to say, what does it mean to that, that God is omniscient? And what does that, what does that matter in my daily life? And, you know, when you're talking about things like Kairos time at the appointed time for the, for the um, kingdom of God, like, what does that actually mean at the appointed time in the kingdom of God? And so I just began to dive into that more and more. And I'm going to tell you, this is what I've come to the conclusion of. You want to hear a conclusion? I do. 
I don't understand after researching the omniscience of God, Bianca, for five years, <laughs> I do not understand it anymore. But I do rest in it in a different way. And I do have a different level of peace because I am a person that wrestles against a lot of things. That's been my life as a, as just a historical wrestler. It has brought me a different level of peace. I sleep differently at night. So I'm going to put the cookies on the lower shelf. When you speak about omniscience, you're talking <laughs> that God knows everything. Girl, I just, I just like to make it plain. You're, you're so wise. You are so smart. I, mean, <laughs> I don't know I, about I, that. I listen to you and I'm like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. But mm -mm. I want to talk about when you say omniscience, you're talking about like God knows the good and the bad. God knows the hurt and the pain. God knows our dreams. God yeah. knows our night terrors and That's our right. nightmares. God knows, God knows, God knows. One of the things that, um, I'm excited about is when you talk about that God knows our our dreams. Yeah. Now you're not talking, we were just talking about night tears and yeah. I'm not talking about nightmares and the opposite of nightmares is dreams. No, I'm talking about like our our desires. Yes. For those, for, I know that there's someone out there that might feel a little like, have maybe fallen down on their hands and knees or straight up on their butt and they're wondering like, I, I, I have this vision, I have this dream, and it feels like everything I've done to like get there, I'm just falling. I'm falling yep. over the hurdles of life. Does God know about my dreams? What do you say to that person? Well, I would say I deeply relate. We were just talking about failure and disillusionment and disappointment in, in dreams that you have and things that you wanna do in ways that you feel like you failed and didn't, accomplishment, didn't accomplish. That is the biggest re reason people don't wanna dream again. It's disillusionment mm -hmm. with God, right? Or disillusionment over those broken dreams or disappointment. That's, that's, mm -hmm. that's why. So absolutely, that's very, very normal for us. I want to tell you that God not only knows about your dreams, but he was in there. He was in the dream with you before you even dreamed it. So God knew about that. God knows about that. He also knows what what dreams that you don't even know about. And mm -hmm. so it's it's one of those things where... Uh, as we go on in our life, we can build those walls around ourselves where we say, I'm never going to dream again. I'm never going to hope again. I'm never going to believe again. And yet all that does is keep us very narrow in our in our life and keep us very feeling even more uh, disappointed and disillusioned. That is why it is so important to believe that someone and not yourself and not the other person that you feel like has limited you, which by the way, I, I, I also believe that other people can limit us. I believe that's very real. I also believe we can limit ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to understand that you also talk about that in your book, grit, don't quit. We actually can, <laughs> we actually can limit ourselves. And I think yeah. we have to get to the point where we're able to be honest with that. Where have I limited myself in my own life? It's actually freeing to know that. And some of the dreams that we have for our life, we simply aren't pursuing because we've believed narratives and we've lived in this very limiting place. So I think it's very important to know that. I just want to give you a super, super simple definition yeah. of omniscience for anybody who feels like that's just super smart. And I'm not super smart, by the way. I just have studied this a lot because I didn't understand it. That's why I went to look at it. It is basically God's unlimited knowledge of things past, present, and future. That's it. Mm -hmm. And so that's very important for us to know that because in my life, Bianca, if someone doesn't know more than me, because I know how little I know, especially the older I get, the more I realize I know very little. If God doesn't know more than me about those dreams in my heart, about those things that I can't make right, about that person who has hurt me deeply and I can't do anything about it, about the ways I'm limited, if someone doesn't know more than me about it, I'm in trouble. And about this crazy nuts world, if someone doesn't know more than me, we're all in trouble. <laughs> okay, so you mentioned a couple words that I want to hit on: disillusioned, disappointed, and I have to, I have to, I wrote down this where I want to go in a second because I'm a church kid. I know anyone who's listened to the podcast, they've heard me say, my dad's a pastor, my husband and I are church planners, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a church kid, I think if I'm honest, we're going to have a moment of transparency. I'm fatigued when people just like slap a verse on yeah. failure or on trauma and then they want to move, move on. It's like a move on mentality like, you know, all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. Uh, listen, 
I don't want to sound cynical or skeptical. I want to sound incredibly serious here. For the person that is having these why questions, what is something that they could sink their teeth into? Don't put a Band-Aid over a bullet wound. You have studied the omniscience that God knows all. So if he knows all, what do we do with the person that's asking the why questions? And what do we do when we have the why questions? Well, the first thing I would say is that I'm the biggest skeptic in the room. I get it. I'm a pastor's kid too. I've heard everything frontwards, backwards, upside down, all the things. There comes a point in your life, Bianca, where there are only so many alternatives, right? And you can reach for the the quick fix, the quick relief. But what we're talking about here is needing some kind of thing that has more than that quick relief. I mean, I'm a pragmatist, okay? I just look at what's on the table and I say, well, I can reach for something quick, which will be getting drunk, getting high, you know, porn, whatever the case may be. I can do that. I, I, I'm, I can, I can, if I want, I just know none of those things have ever brought relief that's of any kind. So the idea that, that the only way to cure those, those things that have happened in my life, the disillusionment, the disappointment, all that thing, that's a long play. That's not what Mm. anybody wants to hear, but it's a long play. Mm. And it is from the, the way that we, the, the way that we get those things solved and by the way, we'll never fully be, those things will never be fully solved. I don't know if this is bad news for someone, but I just want to be real with, with us. The way that those things get solved is when we finally go to heaven. Okay. That's when we have our new bodies and we have our new minds and we get really better. But on this earth, the measure of peace and joy and all of those things, relief comes from the long play of being with God and letting him in infect our bodies and our souls. These temporary things numb us. They make us feel better. We've got to have more and more and more and more and more of them. So what I'm asking people to do is believe that God does know something that does take faith. That does take grit, spiritual grit. That does take spiritual disciplines of prayer and reading the word of God. And I wish I could give away around that. So verses like all things work together for good. The reason why we don't like to, you know, hear those in a quick way is because good doesn't feel good quickly. Ooh. But what happens is as we spend time with God, we, it, that, that good seeps into our souls and our mm. bones, Bianca. Mm. And the goodness of God is real. It is real. And so as we spend that time, we, we experience that. You know, it's why sometimes you look at somebody and go, I don't know, they've been through so much hell, but somehow that person, it's real. I see it on their face. I feel it. It's coming out of their pores. They know Christ. There is something there. You can't make that stuff up. And I'm just telling you over time, the long play that happens. Now, that's not popular in culture because we want the quick steps. But I'm telling you, the goodness of God is real, but it ha- it's the long play. Well, someone is a preaching. <laughs> you got to take us to church right now. Listen, I, I have to let the rabbit out of the hat. I got to let the cat out of the bag. The reason why, if someone's listening right now, maybe you're rolling your eyes and you're saying, okay, the long game. Oh, it's going to take a long time to get good. Let me tell you something. Lisa has studied, yes, five years on the omniscience of God, but she is the author of God Knows. When your worries and whys need more than temporary relief. This is something she's not just trying to put a Band-Aid over. This is something that she has spent time studying. And so you had said the long play. And so what do we do in the waiting? What do we do in the waiting? Um, in your book, you list uh, a couple things that I want to list really quick because I want this to be practical for people. Yeah. Um, I, I, there's going to be a link to the book in the show notes. But one of the things that I liked is that you made it. You are a pragmatist. Yes, yes, yes. But you also make it very practical, which I love. And what we can do in the waiting, especially when we feel like our the dreams that we have dreamt and the visions that we've seen aren't actualized. Like what we what we what we've seen isn't what we see. You know, like what we hear the Lord saying isn't our here in this moment. And here are four things that you talk about in uh, while we're waiting for our our dreams is don't give up on your dreams simply because you're weary. 
Hmm. Don't let fear keep you from taking the first step. Don't let assumption or bitterness creep in. If God isn't working on your timetable, girl, why are you coming? Why are you coming for us? <laughs> and lastly, you say, don't ask other, ooh, I gotta speak slow for this. Don't ask other people's permission to fulfill the dreams God has for you. I'm gonna repeat those twice because they were nice and then I want you to unpack one of those like give us oh. give us something to hang on to or more or more i'm not giving yeah. you rules but number one don't give up on your dreams simply because you're weary number two don't let fear keep you from taking the first step number three don't let assumption or bitterness creep in if god isn't working in your timetable and number four don't let other people's permission or don't ask other people's permission to fulfill the dreams that god has for you can you unpack one or more of those because i want people really to hold on to it's in the waiting it's yeah. in the waiting where the good happens. It's in the waiting where we're pressed. It's in the waiting where the pressing leads to the oil. It's in the waiting where the crushing of the grape leads to wine. Like, mm. take us on that. So, unpack. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to do two. I'll do the first one quickly. First of all, a lot of people give up on their dreams when they just need a nap. I mean, that's the reality of it, Bianca. They just need to go take a quick nap. Because here's the thing. We get tired. We get tired of waiting. But we also get physically tired. And I'm telling you. There are a lot of things that I've thought, I'm going to give up on this just because I needed to go take two hours and lay down. <laughs> so somebody may just need to go take a nap and you're going to be fine. So that's just a quick word for somebody. But let me just go ahead, and, let me go ahead and go into the permission thing because this one, I'm telling you, this is going to set somebody free. We take way too many polls when it comes to the dreams mm. that we have in our heart. We're going around and we're going, hey, what do you think of my dream? What do you think of my dream? This might be an epiphany for someone listening. You don't actually need people to believe in your dreams. Now, you might think, oh, I, I got to have, I got to have at least my people. They got to believe in my dreams. No, you don't. You know what you need people to believe in? You need people to believe in you. And here's the thing. You might think, well, I can't separate my dream from me. True and false. The dream is a part of you, but what you're actually asking people to do is a little bit impossible. So God, think about it this way. God has put a dream and imparted a dream inside of your heart. That is a very personal one-on-one -on -one experience. So you might have been lying in bed. You might have been going through Starbucks. Sometimes I'll be in my bathroom, maybe even in the shower, and God will put, implant a dream inside my heart. It's a very personal experience with the Lord. And then I might go and try to tell somebody else what my dream is, and they don't get it. Why? Because God hadn't given them the dream. Mm -hmm. He's given me the dream. And so I'm going around and I'm trying to get people to buy into my dream. I'm like, well, listen to this. This is my dream. And this is my, and there might be someone that loves you so much. Maybe Matt Oldhoff is going to believe in a dream because he is wild about Bianca. He's going to believe in that dream because he is mad about you because you are a fox and you're married and he's going to believe in that dream. But the reality is most people aren't going to be that tight and believe in it. But what what you need is your support people to believe in you and you hold that dream close and you and the Lord rock on in that dream together. That's the statement is so, uh, 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 I know I just dated myself, whatever you and the <laughs> Lord go on and you live that dream together, but you need your team that believes in you and work that dream you and the Lord together and, and get some people who can help you make that dream happen but don't expect everybody to believe in the dream they don't understand it probably they weren't there <laughs> when god gave it to you so i need you to quit asking people permission for this in that sense go do it if god told you to do it go do it mm. get the people to help you and get wise counsel along the way some of y'all are out there dreaming wildly and that thing is that thing is off the rails so <laughs> you need some people that can hold you down especially if you're a dreamer by nature and i'm going to tell you uh, a lot of people dream we all dream very differently and some people are wild dreamers and they do have a dream every second and they need those wise, wise people in their life but you don't need people to believe in your dreams. You need people to believe in you. Oh, somebody's getting set free just listening to that. Yeah. Listen, as we, there's so much that I want to unpack, but I want, again, I love the practical, the pragmatic. I love that we're just making this so tangible for people. 
when we talk about God knowing, we've talked about our, like the dreams are just something very positive, but I also want to, and we're not gonna end here so it feels like all Debbie Downer, but <laughs> I feel like it's worth mentioning. We can talk about dreams and that feels very life-giving, but I also wanna talk about like when, when there's failure and it's easy can maybe to point at somebody or where there is failure and somebody has made us the, 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 the reason for it, um, we are prone in our flesh to want vindication. Yep. We are prone in our flesh, to, whether right or wrong, because there are, there are moments where people have wronged us. I know, I, I can think just in the last couple of years, I feel like, Lord, do you not see what these people are saying about me? Do you not see what this person is doing to me? Do you not see, like, God, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not know? And so I think in those moments where we're frustrated and we want vindication, that there are healthy and unhealthy things to do when life or situations feel unfair. You write about this, so I want us to kind of, I want, I want people to mentally get like two sides, almost like a pros and cons list, but I want a mirror here, like side-by-side -side comparison, a juxtaposition of an unhealthy approach to things that feel fair. And then I want you to give us a healthy approach to things that feel unfair. Because I want people to know, because we're all gonna have moments where we'll be like, I can't believe that person did that to me, Lord sick them, Lord go get them. So <laughs> instead of us getting like, pulling out our earrings and getting all ratchet, what do we do? when we want vindication and there's a healthy and unhealthy way to deal with moments that feel unfair. Walk us through that. The reason why Bianca said pull out her earrings and get all ratchet is because she read the, the she read the story in the beginning of that chapter where I talk about <laughs> where I basically pulled out my earrings and got ratchet. Because listen, I can do them with the best of us. Uh, that, that part of my personality is very present when the Holy Spirit <laughs> does not take over my life. Um, I really do open up that chapter talking about a story when I did confront someone, it did not go well. The reality is, is um, I will, I want to say an unhealthy approach is basically giving in to your feelings in that moment and going and confronting someone when you have not taken it to the Lord. I'm just going to tell you, it will go badly because what we think in that moment, Bianca, is that we're going to feel better. And we think that we're going to, you know, just getting that out and taking matters into our own hands is going to uh, vindicate us. What actually ends up happening is the great majority of the time after that first rush of adrenaline, which, by the way, feels kind of good. I'll just put that out there. After that moment, we feel worse. And usually it creates a bigger mess for us. And we don't feel better. What we think what's going to happen is, let me put the, the, the hot potato in your hand. So you have, I started to say screw me over. Can I say that on your you, show? It's called we're going there, baby. You could say that. <laughs> okay. The worst you, things have been said. Thankfully, uh, we get the big button. All right, good. Know. Well, I, I've had a few <laughs> thoughts, but I've kept most of them to myself. But I will say that you, you think, well, you screwed me over. So I'm going to, now let me throw the hot potato in your hands mm. and let me do this to you. But what you're doing is you're throwing the hot potato of your pain into their hands, but it's still your potato, yeah. right? I, I'm, yeah. I'm throwing it to you, but it's still my potato of pain. I'm just yeah. putting it in your hands, but I'm still feeling it. And so yeah. there's, there's nothing that actually solves anything. So that's the wrong approach because it's not helping you. It's causing you actually more problems. The healthy approach would be the three P's, which would be pause, pray, and ponder, which are, you know, super important. I mean, it, wait, wait, that, you, wait, hold on. We have to, that's good. That's good. And I'm not pausing <laughs> for any of the listeners. I'm pausing for myself. Okay. Yeah. I'm pausing for myself here. Pause. pause. Yeah. And that's right. where we are. Uh, calming our amygdala. That's when we are, yeah. uh, we're, 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 we're bringing our senses down to reality. We're box breathing. We're calming our central nervous system. Okay. So that's pause. I mean, it's pray. count to 10. Like this is the old, this is not, this is not rocket science here. It's the count to 10 principle. I mean, but it really is. If I would have paused in that moment, instead of confronting someone over a rumor that had been told about my family, that was what the story was about. Mm -hmm. If I had paused, I might not have just you know, jumped in my car and driven over and done that, right? So pause, how many times if we would pause, we wouldn't get into those social media fights or whatever the case may be, said something that we have to mop up after. Mm -hmm. So pause, ponder, thinking through it, actually thinking about that. A lot of times we don't ponder what the think about what the consequences of our action might be in that moment, or even ponder what how God could make something right in a better way. I mean, honestly, mm. I know we don't want to get all spiritual about it, but 
do we believe that the God who we say that we have put our faith in can do a better job than we do? I mean, we are living a life that we have committed our lives to someone who we say that we put our trust in, we put our faith in. So I'm sorry, we have to get a little bit spiritual here. Do we actually believe that? Do we actually believe that God can take care of it better? Let me tell you something. There have been times in my life that I've wanted to get even with someone. And I have thought of a lot of ways to do it. All right, can I, I mean, I, I won't tell you what they are because you might no longer buy my books. So the reality is, is I've thought of a lot of ways to get even. And I can tell you that there have been times that the Lord has worked it out in a way that I've thought, boy, you're genius, God that that came yeah. around in such a way that I could have never predicted. Yeah. And sometimes that's been through a letter where they've said I was so wrong. And sometimes I've never gotten that letter, but always in my heart, it has been resolved one way or the other. And I want to tell you there, have there are still things that are lingering for me. There are still people that have hurt me that I wish it weren't so So I can't say this is like a perfect, I don't live a perfect life. None of us do, but I do have to believe and trust that either God has a better way of taking care of it than me or not. I either believe the Bible on that or I don't. And then of course the last one is pray. And you know, I do believe that prayer does help. It does heal a place inside of our heart that we can't get otherwise. So after, after walking us through failure, falling, faltering in life, walking us through the disappointment and the disillusionment, walking us through uh, the the pause, the ponder, the pray. We've been asking a lot of the why and, and then answering with God knows. God knows your dreams. God knows your hurt. God knows when you want to feel vindicated. He knows these things. So Lisa, in this, in this last question, I really want you to, to speak to our hearts. I want you to shepherd those that kind of feel like bruised and tender. We've mm. been asking a lot and you've studied the omniscience of God. God knows, God knows, God knows, which has left me to ask the last question. Mm. Does God care? Mm. I want to wrap this episode up thanking you for your time, but I really want you just to speak to our hearts. More importantly, I want you to speak to our souls and answer, does God care? Yeah. Gosh, uh, that that just honestly touches such a place in my own heart. I, I I think that's a precious question because that's what we all really want to know, right? Mm. You know, it's not just about the knowledge. I think that's one of the m- mistaken beliefs when we think about God knowing because in our world, we can know information all the time. And it doesn't do any good. People know things and they don't act on it appropriately. People know things and they act on it inappropriately. People know things and they willfully hurt us. And one of the things that I love the most about God, Bianca, is that in that attribute of God that only he has, that supreme infinite knowledge of things past, present, and future, is all of the other things that are amazing about God, which is God loves, God sees, God cares, Uh, God does work all things for the good. They're all of his attributes. God can't separate himself from himself. And though, and so that's one of the things that I love the very most that when he knows all of the things about your life, all of the things that you've been through, all of the trauma, all of the ways that you've been abused, all of the ways that someone has limited you, all of the ways that you've hurt yourself, all of the things, not only in your past, but in your future, all of the things that you'll do, all of the things that you're facing in the present, that when he knows all of those things that intertwine with that is this tender love this beauty, this care, this, this seeing you in that space. And so he's knowing all of these things about your life and he's working in those things even right now, even though you can't see it, even though you don't know it because you're limited, because you don't have his infinite knowledge and wisdom and all of those things. And even though one, we don't, we don't live in the future, beautiful place that we once will, you have to know and believe that God so very much cares about you, that he is preparing that place for you, that one day, all of those things that aren't right now will be made right because he cares and loves you so very much. Does God care? Oh yes, he cares. And he cares in a way that we could never know or understand. Friend, thank you for ministering to my heart. I know that many people's hearts, minds, and souls will have a little breath 
in their sails, little wind in their sails. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your words. But most importantly, thank you for your heart. You care. I feel it. I see it. I know it. And I'm so grateful for you, Lisa Whittle. Thank you for your words. They matter. Thanks.